For more than two decades, we've been educating our listeners about financial topics that are most important to you. Do you have enough money to retire? How will you keep from running out of money? What's your plan for managing market risk? What about taxes, inflation, and health care? Each week, we talk with an advisor at Lucia Capital Group about these issues and more. This is Managing Your Financial Future. All right, what do you say? Let's manage your financial future, huh? Let's do this thing. Here we go. Are we ready, Professor Plum? We are ready. That's right. Who's with me? (laughs) Let's Let's go! go. (laughs) Yeah. Ah, what a rousing intro that was. You know what we need? We need uh, We need some applause. Wait a minute here. Let's see. Do I have any applause on this machine? I don't. Ah, I don't. Doggone it. Oh, well. All right. So there goes a minute. Uh, I'm Johnny Dean, your podcast host. Uh, Thank you for joining us uh, today. You are Professor Plum. I am. And you are the certified financial planner professional. You're the CFP with an R, registered trademark R (laughs) right after it. Does that cover it? Yes. And you're a wealth... Accredited. Accredited wealth, wealth management, management advisor. advisor. I'll never get it. I'm just going to okay. make you say it, as I said, every single time. Uh, lots to talk about today. Here's something I, I, I looked. I don't think I've I don't think we've covered this on this podcast yet. And what is that? Well, uh, you asked in, in your best leading question voice. Because I actually have not seen what you're <laughs> going to talk about. No, but you know the topic, which is retiree regrets. Okay. These are the. Uh, the uh, I and, regret and, not taking better care of myself over the years. <laughs> well, you know what? When you get off of finance, that's one of them. That's it, that's one of the regrets. I I did a just a, a ton of research on this because I wanted to find out what the most common ones were. Okay. And I don't want the you know some some websites are kind of self serving in that regard. Very self. serving You know. Yes. Uh, I I regret not uh, not not painting my living room. Says the paint uh, you know website. <laughs> The National Painters Association. Right, exactly. And there you go. Thank you. So, so I had to be careful about how I did this. No, I don't know about careful, but I had to be. I had to be thorough. You had to be cognizant of where that re- the results yes. were coming from. Right. So I, I found a bunch of different websites. Not all of them financial, but it, it was interesting how the top regret of retirees, and I'm speaking from a financial standpoint here, how the top regret was pretty much the same thing. And you could probably guess this: um, the top regret was that they wish they would have saved more money. Now, according to a survey conducted by Lincoln Financial Group, 62% of retirees would like to go back and plan differently for retirement. And Bankrate put the number of retirees regretting their financial choices at 74%. Are they asking, have you made a financial decision in your lifetime that you regretted? Would yeah, you, yeah. There oh, have been have. bad decisions. That should be a hundred percent. Are you regreting? I don't. Maybe if you I, look back, if you look back, you're a retiree. Now these are these are I people back who are already retired. Say, yeah, I wish I would have saved more. But then looking back, it's like, where would that have come from? Well, and, and I don't know where that extra savings would have been able to come from. This is great. This is, you're, you're leading into this. Uh, we're we're of the same mind here, which is good. Okay, so let me just tell you what they said. According to an annual study by Trans, this one was Trans America Center for Retirement Se- uh, Studies, seventy-eight uh, percent of retirees, and in, in this one, seventy-eight percent wish they would have saved more. I don't know who the twenty-two <laughs> percent were who says, "No, nah, I wish I wouldn't have saved more." Oh, I, well, the, maybe they I wish have, they would have. I have run into people that have. They've basically not done anything. They haven't had a life yeah. you know, until they're you know fifty-five, sixty, and they've got tons of money. But then, unfortunately, something will happen. And they can't have the dreams and goals that they were planning on. So, yeah, they save too much at the cost of living during their earlier years. Well, yeah, you may be right. Uh, uh, Retirees, let's see here, uh, EBRI, that's another one I looked at. They were asked to detail what pieces of financial advice they would give their younger selves. The majority, 70%, would advise changing savings habits by saving uh, or investing more or or doing it earlier, which is almost the same thing. And it's until and you actually, we've talked about it in past podcasts that the hardest thing about building a nest egg is not picking the investments. That's not the hard part. It's getting started. It's actually right. prying the money out of your pocket and, well, and and feeling like I have the ability to save. And I think there's ways to be able to maybe trick yourself. And I, I say that in a good way, not a bad way. Yeah, and I think that a lot of the new things with the new four hundred one k's, the automatic enrollment, the automatic escalation of percentage of payment of a uh, distrib- contribution. I think they're all great because it happens without us 
thinking that we have to go and do or actually having to do something. The more we can set it up on and automatic. Gradually. And gradually. And so it doesn't just scare us because unfortunately I see people, I'm going to start saving X amount of dollars and they can't live through with it. And they fail in their minds. And so then it's like they're almost afraid to start up again. Whereas if they start with a little bit lower number and gradually increase that number in a couple of years, they're saving quite a bit. And so it's a matter of getting started is the hardest part. So yes, if you can get something started, if you can get it and then increase it either on an automatic basis or a periodic basis on your own, that'll help you save more. And people think, well, I can't afford to save anything right now. Well, most likely a one, two, three percent of pay into a 401k to get you started. You're most people, at least probably that are listening to this podcast, do have that capability. I mean, they, uh, uh, they, they have a 401k available or, to them. Or they have the ability to save more than they think they're saving. It's amazing that if you set it up on automatic, you, you'll have about the same money left over at the end of the month that you had before. It really is true. Uh, but you saved $150, $250, $500, whatever the case may be that happened. And you're like, I, I'm not sure where the money came from to make that savings contribution. Because I ended up, the checking account has the same amount of money at the end of the month this month as it did before I started. And I don't know what I backed off on, but obviously I backed off on something, I but it, it works. You know, if, if, if I went back to my younger self and I said, you know, obviously I would love to have saved more. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't be sitting here well, today if I'd saved. I, I was going to change but, that statement saying, I would love to have more today. Well, that's what but, saving, yes. But do I, how would I, I don't know I, how I would have done it. I started doing my 401k as soon as I could. I started pushing it as far as I could. You know, yeah, but if I had to ask myself or tell myself, you should be saving more, I'm sure my younger self would have said something along the lines of, Are you I kidding? Can't. I can't. I mean, <laughs> I tell, can't afford to. tell me, older older Johnny Dean, what to cut back on. where is this going to come from? And, I mean, you know, looking at this from uh, the future now, you know, as I look back on it, I, I don't know what was keeping me I was saving, but I, boy, I could have done more. Well, I lived part of this, what we're talking about, in that, you know, when I was a, my younger self, broker than broke, which, you know, I mostly was for my life. And uh, whenever the auto insurance would come due every year, it was like, where am I going to get the Here's money? Here's another $1,000. Yeah, yeah, it was basically $1,000, $1,200. Uh, and it was like, where am I going to get the money? I'd, I'd have to figure out, you know, scrape together money. And so finally one year I just said, okay, fine. I am going to put $100 a month into a separate savings account. I'm going to have it automatically withdrawn from my checking account and moved over to the savings account. Uh, If I have an emergency, I can always get it. But in my mind, I built this wall between my normal checking account and that savings account. That is my car insurance bill. And so I started saving $100 a month. And when the car insurance bill came due, then I, I knew I was going to have the money available for it. But I also realized that I had some other money that, you know, before I started saving, I, I was able to come up with the money. So I started you know, getting used to saving that money, being able to pay it. And then I made it 150 Then I made it 200 And I didn't know where in my budget that extra 50 bucks each time was coming from. But I got used to pushing, and pushing the savings account. Yeah. And so I have no idea what part of my budget changed. See, I just I, know that I started saving, and when I had to make the bill, I always I know that that bill is covered. Now I can sometimes cover it from other sources, and not I don't have to touch my savings to do it, because uh, that's how I used to do it anyway. Uh, but it was just so much easier on me mentally, well, knowing I didn't have to stress about where the heck am I going to come up with that money. It's been said that every dollar you save is a dollar of your future that you have purchased. That's you, you well, have you, you have a little bit more control. And it's it's a wonderful thing. So so they wish they would have saved more. I mean, yeah, I, I've done I've done fine, but I, I'm sure I would love to have saved more. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have more today. So so I can see that that being a regret. Now, you as a financial planner, do, you know, do you see people? You probably deal with people who are decent savers. Well, yeah, most of the time when people are coming in, they have some money that they're worried about. How do I invest this appropriately? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's coming out of the 401k and they want to turn it into an income stream for their retirement. Or they're looking at, yeah, I've got about 10 more years and I need to somehow build up this portfolio. Now I'm going to have to push myself a little bit harder. Obviously, the earlier you start, the easier it is to save a net, you know, for your net worth in the future. The later you start, the harder it is because you don't have as many years of growth to help you out. 
Yeah. Well, this leads into our second regret. Now, the first one, as I said, was they wish they would have saved more. The second regret, according to these surveys, was that they wish they would have documented an overall plan. I mean, had a written plan. Yes, that sounds self-serving because, Professor Plum, this is what you do. <laughs> but as I look through all of these, Transamerica, Lincoln Financial, uh, and yes, these are financial services financial companies. <laughs> but, but I mean, what do they care, really? Bank rate was another one. They don't do financial plans. All of them, the top ones were uh, save more and document an overall plan. It says, now, whether you're far from approaching or already in retirement, a written plan will help put your worries to rest. Transamerica found that only 18% of retirees have a written plan. That seems awfully low to I me. I would have expected that to be higher. Seems low to me. A written financial plan, according to the Schwab Modern Wealth Survey, uh, said, well, let's see, 63% of the people with a written financial plan say they feel financially stable, while only 28% of those with a plan feel the same uh, level of comfort. Without a plan. Without a plan. It says with, but they, they mean, yeah, without a plan. Well, so, and, and, But a 25-year-old, I mean, I guess the the written plan is save. Put a big picture, you know, a big word on your your. Your icebox, icebox, well, yeah, that's, that's an old one. Your refrigerator, you know, save, save, save. Uh, you, know, you don't really need to have a detailed written plan when you're 25, 35, other than... When, it, do, you suggest, when do you suggest that you should start getting a, a written plan? Well, I mean, but I think a, 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 some form of written plan where you write down and you have goals. You say, my goal is to be able to save 10% of my income into the 401k. I'm only at six because I started at six because of my matching contributions at six. I'm making this number up. I'm just, and so I'm starting at six, but I know I need to do more than just the, the matching contributions. So hmm. I'm going to, my goal is to push this either through the automatic escalators that are now available on most 401ks or through me on a quarterly basis, going in and increasing it from six to 7%. Next quarter, making it 8%. Next quarter, making it 10% or whatever and pushing it. So th- I have I have something that I'm shooting for. So I write down the goals that I'm trying to achieve. I need to uh, set up my Roth IRA. So I'm going to uh, start saving X amount of dollars per month, maybe like I did with the with the uh, uh, insurance bill. I want to do my Roth IRA, but I also am worried about needing money. So I'm going to – a Roth IRA now, let's say it, I'm going to go back to the easy math. It was $6,000 a couple of years ago, right, which yeah, is the nice yeah. easy $500 a month. Right, yeah. So I'm going to start saving $500 a month over into that savings account so that when – before I do my taxes, I can put six thousand dollars. I'll have saved six thousand into, and I'll put it in my Roth IRA. And in the meantime, if something goes up, the car breaks down, the washer dry, you know, breaks, the you know whatever outside emergency comes, I've got some money there that I can deal with it. Uh, and so I'm trying to do a couple things at once. I'm trying to build an emergency fund. I'm trying to build up a cash fund to fund my Roth IRA. I'm building my discipline in savings. And but I I think writing down these goals of I want to do this. I may only be able to do two hundred a month right now. I need to get that to 500. So write down my goal. So that's maybe a goal planning rather than a written financial plan. But you have to understand, first off, should I be doing traditional or, for, or Roth IRA? Should I be doing my 401k? Should I be doing... Those are the things that you want to have at least understand the differences and why well, you want to be doing them. You as an advisor, though, of course, put together written financial plans. Oh, we do very detailed plans, but they're typically for retirees that have the money and say... But are these people... Are, are, I mean, do you do these for people who are not yet retired? We do, and we're and getting ready for retirement. So, so, so people in their fifties, what? Well, well, we. I was talking with somebody in their forties the other day, and you've talked. We've you've heard us talk about this many times. We are we are bucket strategy, you know, investors. We deal with the bucket strategy, but and so a bucket strategy is create taking a portfolio and being able to turn it into a stable income that can last for the rest of your life, hopefully. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, uh, I'm. 45. I don't need a stable income. It doesn't mean you can't have a bucket strategy for yourself. It just identifies what you're trying to accomplish and it gives you more uh, detailed view of what you should be investing in and how you should be looking at it and when you should maybe start paring back rather than just listening to the old take 100, you know, minus your, right, your age, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reality is what is bucket number one? It's, bucket number one are the assets that are designed to create your cash flow that you're going to spend in the next five to seven years, you're going to be working for the next 20 years. You are bucket number one. If that, you're in your mid 40s. Your, for this 40 yeah. year old, 40. So you are bucket number one, with the exception you need an emergency fund. You need to be able to have contingency plans. You need to be able to, you know, yeah. and, it, and how much of an emergency fund you have depends on 
what kind of a job you have. If you work for the government where you know you're not going to get fired, you've got a very stable income, you may not need as big of an emergency fund as somebody who is self-employed, especially big ticket item type self-employed things where they get you know a lot of money at one time and then they have to they may not get another big infusion of cash yeah. for six, eight, ten months or whatever. That takes a different kind of money management. But you are the asset that is driving the income. And then bucket number two are the assets that will ultimately turn into a new bucket number one set five, six, seven, eight years from now and last for another five, six, seven, eight years. You're still in the time horizon where you are the one that's going to be driving that income. As a younger as a forty five year old looking to retire at sixty five yeah. or whatever. You know, so you are bucket one and bucket number two. So that means we now have very clear, identifiable investment objectives. All the money we're saving today is for retirement, and it's more than 15 years away. We shouldn't even consider bucket number one or bucket number two typical type assets. Fixed income, no. Safety, we don't need safety. We've got 20 years, 15, 20 years. We are investing for growth, growth alone. Now the question is, what's my best tax advantage? Do I do the traditional? Do I do the Roth? How, make sure I get my matching contribution. How do I then save? Where do I do things? But we know what type of investment we're going to deal because the strategy so it's the, has identified it. It's the saving end of it for yeah, somebody. Yeah, we're trying to age. build the net worth. As and then of course the, the 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 biggest issue is once they get to that retirement age. Now we got to flip things around, and, well, and it's not that's, once you get to the retirement age. It's as you near your retirement age. You know. Bucket number two are the assets that we're going to turn into bucket number one five, six, seven years from now. Yeah. If I'm five, six, seven years out from retirement, I need to start funding bucket two, maybe a little bucket number one, depending upon how aggressive or conservative I want to be. And this is where the written financial plan uh-huh. uh, comes into play. So if you they can wish... see it very easily if, this way. If the regret is that you wish you documented an overall plan, this is a good thing to listen to. Uh, and by the way, you mentioned a bucket strategy. I should throw this in, and I think I mentioned this last week. Uh, we have a bucket strategy guide that's out now. Um, cool. It is everything you want to know <laughs> and more. Things you didn't even think you wanted to know about the bucket strategy. It includes the uh, uh, three. The core. The core three buckets. And then it tells you about the fourth bucket and the fifth bucket if you want them. One is a. Uh, a, a Lifetime a, income. Protected life, income. Protected income. And the other one is an alternative investment kind of thing if you need it. But this particular guide, uh, you should download this because I will tell you, this is what I love about it. Because in the first three pages, like page three, I think it is, page three or four, it says, here's how the bucket strategy works. And it does it in like three quick steps. Oh, here's a short-term, mid-term, long-term bucket. Here's how it works. You can, right. you can read it in about a minute and a half. And then get the idea if you don't know how bucket stra- how, how bucket strategy works. Uh, uh, but if you want more information on that, continue to read, and you can get as deep into the weeds as you want. So if you want to uh, download this, I just want to mention this now since you talked about it, Professor Plum. Uh, the Bucket Strategy Retirement Guide, go to luciacap.com. It's free, L-U-C-I-A-C-A-P.com. You go to the search bar, the search bar in the upper right, type in Bucket Strategy. And then it'll be like the first result that comes up. You'll be okay. able to see it, download it, and read it at your leisure. Uh, it's it's a wonderful tool, and it's 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 a way to learn about the bucket strategy. And just as I said, get as deep into it as you want to. So that's the uh, bucket strategy guide. Okay, so uh, now those are the first two. They wish they would have saved more. They wish they would have documented an overall plan. Two things that are enormously helpful, very much, to anybody who wants to make sure they can get through retirement. Now the third thing that I've found uh, through these, uh, the regret is that they wish they'd planned for health care. Now, I, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but things like um, not thinking about maybe long-term care insurance, uh, because it would seem that the health care, you know, you, generally when you're working, your health care is taken care of through your work. Yeah. Or, you hopefully. know, in, in some fashion, you know, or, or right. you've got, uh, you're on the exchange or something like that. But really, once you hit retirement, uh, you do have Medicare at age 65, but it doesn't cover things like long term care. Right. And well, you know, health insurance, when you're working, doesn't cover long term care. No. And it doesn't cover disability. So you know, the, normally when we're working, hopefully, if we have a cafeteria plan or some type of benefits plan through our employment, we have some disability coverage in, in, in case we're hurt and we, can't work, whether it be short term or unfortunately long term. Uh, that form of insurance, that disability, it changes a little bit. But basically, even after you retired, you need 
or should consider looking at what happens if I'm disabled in a manner where I need help, custodial help, because Medicare will cover you for medical needs. It'll cover you for hospital. It'll cover you for your doctor. But a lot of the expense when you're older is not medical so much as it is custodial. And Medicare doesn't pay for that. And it becomes a very big expense. They're limited on rehabilitation. If you ever need that, you know, it'll cover a certain amount. As as, As long as you're expected to get better. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, just make sure you get better. So pl- not planning for health care is one of the results. Um, only about, according AARP says only about a, th- a third of the people they talk to have tried to estimate how much they're going to need to save and set aside to cover medical expenses. And that's medical a hard expenses. one because, you know. I don't know. You go along and you don't know what it's going to cost you or if it's going to cost it you. It may cost you nothing. It yeah. may cost you hundreds it's of thousands. It's a hard one. Yeah, it really uh-huh. is. So it's a tough one to do, but it's something you do need to uh, to think about. And we've talked about we've talked about different ways to cover long term care. We won't do it here on this particular program, but there are ways to do it. Um, and it's again, I think one of those things where people say, "Well, I can't really afford that," you know. Um, it's, well, you think you can't afford it now? Wait until you go into a nursing home. Well, and that's the whole thing. Yeah, if, if you go you, into a nursing yeah. home. Yeah. So planning or for health care. And the worst thing is if one spouse of a married couple goes into a nursing home and they use a lot of the money yeah. and then unfortunately they obviously you know pass away they leave the surviving spouse with less income because less social security and very few assets left <laughs> well that's true and uh, which is why if, if you can pass most of that risk on to an insurance company in many uh, cases it helps okay uh, uh the fifth one here i would say i would put this well there are two that i would tie at number five uh the fifth or they wish they huh we had. The fourth was, okay, well, they wish they'd saved more. Yeah. They wish they'd documented an overall plan. They wish they'd planned for health care. Oh, I see what I did. Yeah, okay, because it's tied. Well, one, two, three. It's, this is four coming up. It's, these, are, these were tied. They wish they'd learned more about personal finance. Yeah, it's not something that's ever taught anywhere. Uh, and it's something that sounds somewhat intuitive, sounds somewhat you know, normal, but there's a lot of little... Nuances. I was teaching a class this morning. I saw that. You uh, had a bunch of people in, in a classroom setting. And we were just talking about uh, charitable giving, uh, gifting, uh, and the limits of and what to how to how to how to use charitable gifting not only to the charity's advantage, but how do you get the biggest benefit from it on your tax return? Sure. Uh, because the reality is, if you're going to be charitably inclined, you're going to be charitably inclined whether you get the tax deduction or not. But if you can get a tax deduction, why not? <laughs> well, it sure helps if you know how things like that work. And the, it, how you structure it and where it's coming from. Uh, just real quick, we were we have a person that's making very large gifts through the year through, for the next several years and uh, to a, a university endowment. And if they were just using the certain assets, they they had this big stock portfolio with, that they've had for a long time. But if they just used the stock portfolio, they weren't going to get the deduction. Because the deduction is limited on what you're giving. They may, they may not have known that. And so we needed to increase their income to be able to get the full deduction. So by increasing the income, we got a bigger deduction. So we were, we started taking money out of the IRA. They're not old enough for a QCD. Uh, so that we, we're manipulating things to a point where they, they were still staying in a low tax bracket, using up their IRA a little bit to help make the dish and getting the whole <laughs> deduction. How valuable is that? It was fun. But you see, th- th- it's a complicated field. And I-, I believe that relying, this is why I would rely on a financial advisor, somebody who works in this and understands how all this stuff works, especially if their name is Professor Plum. <laughs> or any but. other Lucia Capital Group advisor. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there you go. But it's helpful to learn more about personal finance. Okay, so that one and uh, the other one, that was they wish they had, protected more of their money from taxes. And I think that's why this goes along with learning about personal finance. We've done many shows, many episodes of this podcast on uh, tax brackets, how ta- un- how it helps to understand how taxes work, how the brackets work, what happens when you go into the next bracket, how do you avoid it, what, uh, you know, when you understand how taxation works, at least the way it is currently, Professor Plum, I think you can under- well, you can make more informed decisions on how you're going to structure your income. Yes. When you know what is being taxed, what is not being taxed, what is it, what am I deferring until the later dates? Should I be accelerating today because I'm going to be in a lower? Should I be deferring because then I'll be lower? How does w- w- every action has a consequence? You know, if I take it out now, I'm going to pay tax on it, but then I don't have to pay tax on it later. 
if I don't take it out now, I'm going to have to pay tax on it later. Which one Which is, is affecting me yeah. you know, more positively or negatively? Yeah, uh, they're a major consideration. Um, one of the people said uh, many older Americans with 401k plans don't realize the, the, those monies are taxed when, sorry, they're, I don't know how you when they're cashed out. Well, you see, Professor Plum, this, is, this goes back to the need for financial education. I mean, you know, to, to you and me, I mean, we've been working in this for years and years and years. But, I mean, to, to think that the money coming out of my 401k is not going to be taxed? Yeah, I, I, honestly... Professor Plum, that seems like a basic thing, but there's a segment of the population. I'm not saying it's a large segment, yeah. but there are people, and not an insignificant number from what I've seen, that don't know that the money coming out of their 401k is taxable. Well, there's a lot of misconceptions. Like, I still hear, oh, once I'm 70, Social Security won't be taxable. Well, there you go. Or And so maybe people take that a step further and say, once I'm 70, they won't tax my retirement plans. Well, there are certain states that do not tax your retirement plan distributions, whether it be IRA or pensions, but that's state level taxation, not federal. Well, maybe <laughs> there's some people who have only lived on their retirement plan and, and they only take out, you know, they're married. They've only been taking out 25 grand a year or something. Yeah. And it depends and on they've what got their a lot of personal is. money. Yeah. yeah. You know, or, you know, and it's all a matter of interaction between their personal money and their social security to determine whether their social security is even taxable. Well, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then that's... they get a big infusion one year or they get out to required minimum distribution age and have to start taking more money out of the IRA than they needed before because they were living off personal money. And all of a sudden, boom, they take out 20 grand and they expect their taxes to, oh, I'm in the 12% bracket, 20 grand is going to cost me $2,400 and it's costing them, you know, 4200 $4,300. Like, Wait a minute. How did that happen? I'm not in a 22% tax bracket. I'm in, I only took. 20 grand out of the IRA because I had to, the RMD kicked in, but my, my tax bill went up by 20%. I mean, I'm paying 20% on this money. Wait a minute. That, I, I'm not, I look at the tax brackets. I go, I'm mad. I look them up online and I say, I can have that much money. I can have. It's because of the social security. Because of that daggum social security stuff. That pushed their social security. Into yeah. The now I'm not column. just paying tax on the 20 grand that came out. I'm paying tax on 16, 17,000 of Social Security that I wasn't paying tax on before. Well, this goes back. This is how this all ties in. This goes back into having somebody who understands all this stuff. And it goes back to the idea that you or somebody you work with needs to know that every action, as you said, has a consequence. Yes. You're, if you're taking money out of your 401k, you may have to pay taxes on it. You probably right. will. If you're taking Social Security, there's a chance you may be taxed on it someday. Right. And Or... I've already met the maximum amount of taxation on my Social Security, and now I can go back to a true 12% bracket for a little bit of room. Because and you're now all... I can do some conversions or something to, sure. make, to make it more efficient in the future. Which brings that tax rate down somewhat, your overall tax rate. Yep. <sighs> yeah. It's weird. In some situations, taking more, taking more gives you brings better... me a better tax rate overall. I would love to do that. <laughs> That's a, what a fun thing to do, to show that. How taking more income from a taxable account, right, from an IRA type thing, four hundred one, could could actually give you a better rate of uh, give me a lower percentage, percentage of yeah. overall taxes. Ooh, that's good stuff. Uh, almost out of time. Okay, so the five, the the, the top five regrets. Just to, to, to recap, they wish they retirees looking back wish they'd saved more. They wish they'd documented some type of overall financial plan. They wish they'd planned for health care a little better. They wish they'd learned more about personal finance, and they wish they had uh, protected their money from taxes. There were a few others that I found. Don't really have time to get into these, uh, but they wish they had uh, anticipated unexpected expenses. Okay. They wish they had planned for income, and I think what that means is some form of guaranteed income. Now, the first one, I don't think you can anticipate unexpected. No, you can't. But you can plan for unexpected by having access to cash, whether it's an emergency fund well, that's or what, an empty credit card or that's what a they mean. line of credit. Yeah. I anticipate it's preparing for unexpected and hoping you never have those unexpected expenses, but at least being prepared for them if they happen. I anticipate that there will be unexpected expenses for me. I mean, I don't know I, what I, it's going to be. I don't know what, but I can, I am, I, in my mind, I am guaranteed to have unexpected <laughs> expenses. Yes. I mean, that's it. I, unexpected, I, I, I'm anticipating something unexpected. How's that? Yeah. That's a weird sentence to do. Uh, they wish they'd planned for income a little bit more. They wish they had less debt. Okay, I guess I could see that. And some, not a lot, but some wish they'd retired earlier. And 
there are a lot of people that I mean, you've t- you've talked about it before. Yeah, where we've uh, I've talked to clients, uh, advisors have talked to clients, and I, it was just last week I was talking to somebody, and they said, "Yeah, I want to do this, this. We need this amount of money, such and such." I think they're I can't remember their exact age, maybe fifty three, fifty four, and it was like, uh, "Why are you working? You could it's retire a, today. It's a good position to be in. based on what you said you need from income, and w- the assets that you've identified. You have sufficient cash flow or you could create su- sufficient That's cash it. flow to and, and people well, I don't know what I do if I retire. there's a there's retirement and there's financial independence you know retirement means I am not going back to work I don't want to work I want to sit around on the rocking chair or whatever the case and there's financial independence which says I don't want to have to worry about making the paycheck I want to make sure I've got all my bills covered and then I'll go off and do whatever I want to do. And if I make money, I make money. If I don't, I don't. But I'm going to do something that's good for the economy, good for good for the, the community, good, you know, whatever, you know, give back. And I've had a lot of people doing that. Or so. I'll continue to work until I decide I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, until you get to that proverbial. I, I can get off job. <laughs> I can get off this train. Exactly. Any which way, any, any time I want, I can get off this train. And that's a wonderful feeling to have. Do, well, now, those people you're talking about, did you convince them to quit work? Some. Ah, okay. Not all. Some really don't know 50, what else to do. Yeah, early 50s, it's, I uh, don't know what I would do. And it's not that I'm trying to convince them not to work. I'm just letting no, them know they have options. They have an option, yeah. Yeah. And if nothing else, if nothing else, I mean, if, if all you got out of working with a financial advisor was the knowledge that you don't have to work anymore, you know, if that's the only thing you got out of talking to someone like Professor Plum, wouldn't it be worth your time? I mean, I'm asking this rhetorically, but I'm asking everybody who's listening to this podcast, would it not be worth just talking and saying, gee, I don't have to work till I'm 70? Now, the answer is not always yes, you can retire now. You know, in many cases, it's uh, no, you can't retire. In can't, some Based cases. on what you told me, you can't afford to retire at 52. Yeah, yeah. not at 52. <laughs> but if you're, if I'm not saying that, but you know well, what I'm I saying. I remember early, early in my career, uh, I was talking with somebody who was just getting out of uh, school and starting their practice. They were a chiropractor and they were mid 20s, you know, mid, you know, like I think 27, 28. And they basically said, I want to retire at 35. And I said, okay. And how much income do you want when you retire? And they gave me the number. I said, okay, then you're going to need to have this much money available to you. Because you won't have any pensions, you're obviously not going to have any Social Security at 35 yet. Right. You know, you need to somehow amass X amount of dollars within the next 10 years. Are you looking at inheritance? Are there is there money possibly coming that way? No, no, no. And it's, and they looked at me and said, "Well, how much do I need to save to get there?" And I made it came up with a number. And they said, "That's more than I'm expected to make." So yeah, because you're trying to fund a 50, yeah. 60 year or 50 year payout in 10 years. We know that won't it's work. It's just not going to fly. But for, for some people, for I would say for, for some people, you can look and they're in their... You know. Most people that are getting into their 50s and towards 60s have a better idea. And hopefully they're getting closer. They've done a little bit of... Maybe they've done a little bit of cursory math. Oh my gosh, that's that four-letter word, math. Uh, and uh, looked at what their expenses might be and what their assets are. And they've you know used the proverbial guideline of 4% uh, to try to estimate what their portfolio might give them. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you're trying to do that on your own, I have a feeling you could be missing something. So as I said, it's... Uh, the devil's uh, in the details. Well, it is. And so you you, you talk to uh, Professor Plummer, any of the Lucia Capital Group advisors, and just find out. Find out. Can you retire? Maybe you can. Maybe you, th- maybe you can retire earlier than you thought. It's certainly worth a shot. 800-644-1150. See how I did that? Our sponsor, <laughs> I want to get right back into that. 800-644-1150. That'll, they just, just talk to, if you haven't done so, many of our listeners are already have but if you're new or you haven't done it yet talk to an advisor and find out maybe you can retire sooner than you thought 800-644-1150 or go online luciacap.com l-u-c-i-a-c-a-p.com and don't forget if you're at luciacap.com again you can you can download this free bucket strategy guide it it explains everything that you need to know a lot of detail in it but if you don't want the detail you can read the first few pages and understand at least how the basics of the uh, a, a bucket strategy will work, at least as done by the folks at Lucia Capital Group. LuciaCap.com. Listen to this uh, podcast as you're doing. Subscribe. If you have not done so, do so. Go to uh, Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify, and you can listen to every single episode. I just counted. This is episode number 169. 
So we're not closing in on 200, but we can see it from here. <laughs> 200. Big number. Are we going to have a party? Sure. I'll bring, bring in a cake. Some, I'll bring a cake in. <laughs> if you pay for it, I'll bring the cake in. Yeah, of course. In. <laughs> uh, yeah, d- listen in. You, you, you really don't want to miss any of this stuff. Uh, Professor Plum, thank you so much. You're very welcome. I really appreciate it, as always. Uh, we will talk to you again next time. For Professor Rick Plum, CFP, Certified Financial Planner Professional, I'm your podcast host, Johnny Dean. Thanks for listening. We will, of course, talk to you again next week. The information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice and is not specific to any individual's personal circumstances. Each taxpayer should seek independent advice from a tax professional based on his or her individual circumstances. Different types of investments and or investment strategies involve varying levels of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy will be profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investments may result in a loss of principal. You should always seek counsel of the appropriate advisor prior to making any investment decision. All investments are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Traditional IRA account owners have considerations to make before performing a Roth IRA conversion. These primarily include income tax consequences on the converted amount in the year of conversion, withdrawal limitations from a Roth IRA, and income limitations for future contributions to a Roth IRA. In addition, if you are required to take a required minimum distribution, or RMD, in the year you convert, you must do so before converting to a Roth IRA. IRA withdrawals will be taxed at ordinary income rates. Withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half may also be subject to a 10% penalty tax. Roth IRA distributions of principal from a Roth IRA are tax-free. However, any earnings will be taxed at ordinary income rates, and a 10% penalty tax will apply if withdrawn prior to age 59 and a half or within five years of the date the Roth IRA was established, whichever is longer. Examples cited are hypothetical, are for illustrative purposes only, are not guaranteed and subject to potential federal and state law amendments. There is no guarantee that you will achieve the results discussed or illustrated. Long-term care coverage policies and provisions may not be available in all states. Approval may be subject to the terms and conditions of the insurance company. Insurance product guarantees are subject to the claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company and are subject to their terms and conditions. Insurance services offered through LPL Financial or its licensed affiliates. California Insurance License Number 051-8721. Rick Plum is a registered representative with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and member FINRA SIPC. The investment professionals are affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital Group, a separate entity from LPL Financial. 